questions and listening to him and so Shufay entering Medina as a guest he asked who this man was and he was told that this man was Abu Hurairah the great companion of the Prophet so he waited until the crowd dispersed and he waited until Abu Hurairah was all alone and he went up to Abu Hurairah and he said Ya Aba Huraira, O Abu Huraira, you were of the closest companions of the Prophet You were with him in his journeys when he was in Medina. So tell me of a hadith. Tell me something that you heard from the Prophet that you took in, that you memorized and that you understood. And that there was no one with you except the Prophet so Abu Hurairah, he said, I will tell you of a hadith. That I was with the Prophet wasallam. It was only me and him. And I took it in and I understood it. And when Abu Hurairah began to narrate the hadith, he let out a yell, a cry. And he collapsed and he fainted. So Shufay waited a little bit and Abu Hurairah got up. And he said, I will tell you of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that I took in, that my heart understood, and that there was no one except me and the Prophet ﷺ. And he began to narrate the hadith again. And just as he began to narrate it, he collapsed again. Shufay waited a little bit. Abu Hurairah got back up again. He wiped his brow, he was sweating. He said the same thing over again. He said, I will narrate to you a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that I heard and it was only me and him. And this time he let, out, he let out a third and a more severe cry and he collapsed again. To the point that Shufay narrates that he had to lift up Abu Hurairah. 
And finally Abu Huraira was able to gather himself and he told the hadith. The hadith that had scared him enough that it made him collapse three times. It made him faint three times. And what was this hadith? Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet wasallam told him, Ya Abu Huraira, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers the creation from the beginning until the end, that when he begins the judgment of the creation, he begins with three people. And he brings them forward. The first of which is a person who memorized the Qur'an. He was a student of the Qur'an. He taught the Qur'an. He had a beautiful voice. He was considered to be a scholar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him of the blessings that he had blessed him with. Of being able to memorize the Qur'an. Of teaching the Qur'an, of having a beautiful voice, of having a beautiful standing amongst the people. And he said, what did you do with this blessing? So this man, he said, Oh Allah, I learned the Qur'an for your sake. And I taught it for your sake. I recited it to the people for your sake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him at this point, كذبت. He said, you lied. And imagine, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling him this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more knowing of what is in this man's heart than this man is. And he said, you only recited and you only learned this Qur'an so that people can say he's a scholar. And it was said. So what you wanted in this world, for people to acknowledge you, for people to look at you for the fame, you were given in this world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders that he be dragged on his face into the hellfire. And the second person, a man who fought in the sake of Allah, or so he thought. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same thing, He reminds him of the blessings, of giving him strength, of giving him the ability to fight in his cause. And he said, what did you do with these blessings? So the man, he says, Oh Allah, there wasn't a sake for fighting except that I fought in your sake. I went out, I left my family, I left my friends, I left my home for your sake alone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again tells him kadhabt. He said, you lied. But rather you went out and you fought so that people can say that you were brave, jari. And it was said. So you had that standing amongst the people in this world. But now you get your recompense. You wanted only this world, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders for him to be dragged on his face into the hellfire. And the third person, a person who had a lot of wealth, and he gave it in all the causes that he was asked to give in for the sake of Allah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again reminds him of his blessings, of all the wealth he had given him, the ability to give to this cause and that cause. So he asked him, what did you do with these blessings? So the man replies, Oh Allah, there wasn't a cause that I was asked to give in in your sake except that I gave. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the third time, He tells him, كذبت. He said, you have lied. But rather, you have given, and rather these actions of you giving your wealth were only so that people can say that you were generous. Only so that you can get the praise and the fame and the thanks of the people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders for him to be dragged on his face into the hellfire. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he turned to Abu Huraira when he narrated this or when he gave this hadith to him and he said, these are the first three people who will be dragged on their face on the day of judgment into the hellfire. They will be punished before the murderers. They will be punished before those who committed open shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu is teaching us something very important. That these three men, that these three people, they had the outward actions. Their outward actions were beautiful. Giving in the sake of Allah. Struggling in the sake of Allah. Learning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. There are no actions that are greater than these. Yet, while their limbs committed these great actions, they were missing the one thing that would have made these actions acceptable. The most important thing for these actions to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is ikhlas, sincerity. Doing the action, doing the act of worship for no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when this action, when this 
action of the heart was removed, all the reward went to vain. All their actions were useless. So we see the importance of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ikhlas. In fact, it is the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so that we worship Him alone. And ibadah here is not accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless it fulfills the conditions of ibadah. The most important of which is that it's sincere, is that it's meant for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That when we give, we give, whether people see us or not is not the issue. That we give and our heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we give only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not so that people can say He's generous. Or that we pray and when, even if people see us praying, that it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and deserves that worship. Not only that, but when we look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we see that no one was more sincere in his worship of Allah than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that when she came, one night she woke up and she looked for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She moved her hands to see if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was next to her and she couldn't find him. And she looked up and she saw that the Prophet ﷺ was in sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to him and crying. This was the relationship that Allah that the Prophet ﷺ had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if she hadn't woke up, she wouldn't have known, and no one would have known that this was what the Prophet ﷺ was doing. And we see it in the lives of the companions and in the lives of those who came after them. That they were eager. And that the most important thing to them was the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the praise of others. Zayn al Abidin, who is the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he used to go out at night by himself, carrying food, carrying sadaqah to the poor and to the orphans of Medina. That no one knew about this, he would do this for years. No one would help him with it. Not a servant, not his kids, no one. This was something that he had done by himself. And the only way that people found out about this was after his death, when they came to wash him, they saw that his back had black marks on it. The effect, the scars and the marks of him carrying the food on his back by himself at night. And that after he passed away, that the charity had cut off. Meaning all these people who were receiving sadaqah, who were receiving this, this food, they had stopped receiving it. So it was known that it was from him. But if it wasn't for this, and this was only have been something between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the stories of this are numerous. Zayd ibn Abi Hind, also one of the great scholars, he used to fast every other day and no one would know about it. His family would give him food in the morning and he would go out with the food as if he was going to eat it. The day he was, he was not fasting, he would eat it. But the days that he was fasting, he would give it in sadaqah. And when he came back to his house, he would eat with his family at maghrib time as if he had eaten in the morning. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, the great Imam, he said that I wish that this knowledge that I had given, this knowledge that was learned from me was not attributed to me at all. That people would have learned this knowledge and that they would not have known that it had come from me. So that I would be rewarded for it and that no one would praise me. So this is the sincerity that they had. That their hearts were connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they didn't care about anything except that the angels were writing down these good deeds for them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew of these good deeds. So then the question becomes, how can we develop this sincerity? How can we develop this closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ikhlas, this thing that is a condition for our actions to be accepted? And the first way that we can do this is by knowing who we're dealing with. By knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. If we recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His status, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, it increases our love for Him and it leads to us wanting to worship Him alone and not worrying about what anyone else thinks. As Ibn al-Qayyim says, he said, مَنْ عَرَفَ اللَّهَ أَحَبَّهُ لَا مَحَالَ Whoever knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will love Him guaranteed. When we hear the Prophet ﷺ tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to us than our own mothers. When we hear the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Latif, 
Meaning the, the one who saves you from something, one of the meanings of it is the one who saves you from a danger that you didn't even know that you're in. Al-Wadud, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most loving. That we have a special place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Imam al-Shawkani said that the tears of the believer, let alone the believer himself, is more sacred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the Kaaba. So if we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how much He's blessed us with, if we recognize and acknowledge these blessings, it leads us to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worshiping Him, to want to worship Him alone and not to want to have to mix that worship with anyone else or with anything else. The second way is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make dua to Him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gifts ikhlas, gifts sincerity to who He wishes. And a person will not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously for something, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him that thing that he asks for. If you ask with sincerity. And not only that, but dua is a practical application of ikhlas. Right? Not only are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that gift of ikhlas, but you're actually practicing ikhlas. Why? Because when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, especially in secret, you're recognizing and you're acknowledging that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bless you. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you what you need. And this is the essence of ikhlas. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu said, al dua hu al ibadah That dua is the essence of worship. Because it's a, an acknowledgement. It's the slave recognizing and telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I don't have anything or anyone except you. And you're turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're begging Him and you're showing that weakness that we have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third is to remember our, the fact that we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember death and remember the hereafter. That we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed. And that if we want to, our actions to be accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have to come to Him with sincerity. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا That whoever would like or whoever wants to hope, to have hope in the meet, his meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then let him commit righteous actions, let him do righteous deeds, and let him not associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Openly or in secret. Riya, showing off in our actions of worship or turning our worship to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final thing that we can do is that we have to be constantly aware of our actions. That anytime we do something, we think, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially our acts of worship? Or am I doing it for someone else? And it's not easy. It's something that takes over and over. It's something that takes a struggle with our own nafs with our own desires. So Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, he said, it took me 40 years to work on my intention. 40 years. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes us from amongst those who worship Him with sincerity. That He makes us amongst those that when we go to Him on the Day of Judgment, we have our actions and we have our mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has accepted our actions. أقول ما تسمعون أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله على فضله وإحسانه وأشكره على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له تعظيما لشأنه وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد بن عبد الله عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى رضوانه أما بعد فأوصيكم وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل ثم أعلموا عباد الله أن الله أمركم بأمر بدأ فيه بنفسه وثن بملائكته وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون فقال عز من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وارض اللهم عن الأئمة الحنفاء 
الخل... الأربعة الخلفاء أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي ولستة الباقين من العشرة الكرام وعن أصحاب نبيك أجمعين وعن التابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين ودمر أعداءك أعداء الدين اللهم انصر المسلمين المستضعفين المجاهدين في كل مكان عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر الله يعلم ما تصنعون